there any point in people wearing face masks? <laughs> so I, I was persuaded two years ago to do some testing. We have a particular machine that we use in the lab because a lot of the studies we do is about the way that the virus survives in air. We have a machine where we can nebulize uh, flu virus into small droplets and then we can pass it over the surface of susceptible cells and we can ask, does it come along or not? And we did an experiment uh, where we put various materials in the way and asked how much of the virus on one side got through and could infect the cells on the other side. Now, when, when we work in the lab, we um, sometimes have to wear paper face masks, 3M paper, very cheap, very easy to get. And 99.999% of the virus was blocked by the face mask. So that's fine, okay? But there are other studies where people, for example, in Hong Kong, uh, got students to wear face masks and wash their hands, or wear face masks and not wash their hands, etc. And the problem with wearing a face mask is that you are then tempted to sort of touch your face in other places, for example, your eyes. And we do know that flu can enter the respiratory tract through the eyes. So there is a danger that wearing a face mask is a false sense of security, and then you forget about washing your hands and not touching your face, um, and then you can still end up with virus. So I, I think that face masks could have some use, if only to remind people that they're in a flu-infected environment and they should take care, but you do have to make sure people use them properly and, and don't make things worse. Yeah, next one was. I think. Does someone have the microphone on the right hand side? Hi. Please. Uh, I was interested in your slide on uh, genetic variation. Uh, is there. I don't recall ever having had flu in my mm -hmm. life. I mean, is there a. Is that in the Yes, we'd love. <coughs> So I suspect you have had flu. I, um, if we took some of your blood and tested your antibodies against the flu viruses which have circulated in your lifetime, we would almost certainly find that you have antibody responses to flu viruses every five to seven years. So this has been done, and where people like yourself said, oh, I've never had flu, but if you take your blood, you will find that you have been infected by a flu virus and you have made antibodies to it. Um, the point about all viral infections, in fact all infections really, is that it's a sort of pyramid that, that lots of people get infected and don't get very, very sick, and then some people get moderately sick, and then some people get very sick and sadly succumb. And you may be one of the lucky people that for, for whatever reason have, have always remained in that sort of bottom majority. That could be because you've got a very healthy innate system, so the opposite of the IFIT M3, and your versions of those kinds of genes might be especially good ones. And it is actually quite hard to use genetics at the moment to discover that, because it's much easier to see the rare events where a common disease makes people go to hospital and then you can sequence theirs. It's rather difficult to sequence the vast majority of people and find out why they may not be going to hospital. So we don't yet know whether or not there are super resistors. Um, I, but I think it wouldn't be that you were resisting infection altogether. It might just be that you were not getting as sick as other people in that. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. And I know nothing about CRISPR technology, so perhaps you could explain how you change the genes of a chicken. Yep. And if you change the genes of a chicken, do they naturally produce chickens that change genes? <laughs> yes, they do, yes. Yes, so, so they will do if you change the germline genes. So the idea is that you take the, the eggs or the sperm and you change those and then you make new chickens from those and breed those chickens and then you will have chickens who are all genetically changed in the way that you want them to be. So, so yes, you, you, the idea is not that you'd have to do this time and time again for every chicken, but you would make your founder chickens that you breed from. And in fact, the, the poultry industry is based, uh, because it's a breeding industry, because chickens have been so intensely bred for traits for decades, 
there are two or three huge poultry producers in the world. That's it. It's almost a monopoly. And they own grandfather birds and grandmother birds who, who are very, very precious because they have all the found, found a genetic stock and all the chickens in the world come from this very small genetic pool and they're shipped from these breeding facilities all around the world. So it is actually feasible to think that the world's poultry could be altered in this way because it comes from such a small genetic stock in the first place. Um, the way CRISPR works uh, is, is molecular biology. I mean, you, know, you, you basically um, you, you know what the, gen, the genetic sequence is that you want to change. You synthesize a small piece of nucleic acid which looks exactly like that apart from the bit you want to be different and then using the enzymes that, that go along with CRISPR you, you cut one piece out and put the other piece in. Nature is wonderful because it does natural repair so that the ends get knitted up and then lo and behold you have an altered genetic sinner in an egg. Eat good granny and grandpa chickens though. Yes. Yeah. So that's what they specialise in doing at the Roslyn. So, um, slightly technical question. When they, when they dump one of the bodies out of the optic circle and characterise the virus, so there was a slip in the media that there was one gene difference from a modern H1N1 virus, and it, it controlled the speed of replication of the virus and made it very quick. So the, the question is replication and lethality. Is, is there a correlation with speed of replication? Yeah, so, so, I mean, actually, there are more differences than just that with the, with the 1918 versus the modern. I mean, the, the, it looks like almost every one of the genes of the 1918 virus was sort of souped up. Um, it was a really powerful virus, and you're quite right, it did replicate very, very fast. Fast replication, per se, doesn't always make a very dangerous virus, but replication in cells where the virus shouldn't be does, and replication that makes mistakes because it's going too fast and not being careful enough makes bad things happen as well. And so really it's about what I was trying to get across is that that very often happens when the virus is in a place where it's not used to being. Then it makes mistakes because it doesn't know its environment properly, it doesn't interact properly with its normal host. Yes, <coughs> thanks uh, Professor Bartley. Can I ask uh, the greatest tragedy in 1918? Uh, do you know, or indeed anyone else, what percentage of the world population was that at the time? The 50 million? Um, so the case fatality was 2%. And I think that, so 2% of the people who got infected died. And I think that about half the world got infected. Thanks. But I don't think that's quite answered ans with the maths you wanted me to do, but I can't do that fast enough in my head. <laughs> uh, Professor, over here. <laughs> you talked about the slow process uh, reliant on eggs to try and produce uh, protection. Yeah. Is there any work being done to find an alternative? And yes. So, how successful is that likely to be? Yes. So um, people were very concerned in the early 2000s about the reliance on eggs. And a lot of money has been put into building new vaccine manufacturing plants that work on cells, like cultured cells, instead of chicken's eggs. The chicken's eggs have been used for decades because a chicken's egg is a sort of wonderfully sterile environment and you can get them very cheaply but we do now make a lot of other vaccines in cells that we grow artificially in, in huge vats culture vats and we do know how to make flu vaccine in cells and in fact there is a, a product now on the market where flu vaccine is produced in cells and in, in some aspects it is a better product than the egg grown product the problem that we've got, though, is that there still isn't enough vaccine manufacturing capacity in the world to make all the flu vaccine we want to make in cells. Most of the capacity relies on eggs. And so it's, it's quite a slow process to persuade the manufacturers to stop using a vaccine plant, which they've been using for years and makes them money, and start building a new one, which in the longer term will be better. You just have to wait 
for them to decide that. It would be lovely if authorities or governments put more pressure on that to happen. There are some very, very new ideas as well um, coming through where you might, um, there, are, there are new types of vaccines. A few years ago, people thought about DNA vaccines where you just synthesize very cheaply and inject into people's arms and, and your own cells do all the work, make your own vaccine within you. And then that's undergoing a sort of revamp at the moment with RNA, self-amplifying RNA vaccines. And that, there's a concept there where you can make it so simply and so easily that you could have vaccine plants in every country all around the world on very small scale, but local. And this would be very attractive for third world countries who don't have the capacity to, to own and make their own huge vaccine manufacturing facility. But if it was very simple and very small scale, they could control it. And so there's a, there's a big push to sort of give control in the pandemic back to uh, the third world countries. And, and in fact, you know, I was, I was going to add that in 1918, it's right that Scotland didn't carry the, the burden of the 50 million. India did. The third world countries, the countries that had no capacity to help themselves with any kind of medical intervention at all, is where most people died then and where most people would die today if there was another pandemic. May, may I ask you about um, filter, you know, the air conditioning and air things, the spread of infections that way. I'm going to ask also about Legionnaire's disease. We don't hear it mentioned anymore. Is it no longer a problem? Um, no, I think Legionnaire's disease is still a problem where you have certain types of air conditioning plants that have water and you can have, it's a bacterial infection and you can have bacteria that amplify that water and then are aerosolized, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, anywhere where you've got a closed community of people, hundreds of people sharing the same air, uh, is going to be a breeding ground for, for spread, spread of flu. Um, that's probably, you know, where you've got people in close proximity, the virus has got less of a task to get from me to you. The closer we are, the, the more of each other's air that we're breathing. So an aeroplane is a very good place for flu to spread, and there have been some wonderful studies where a flu outbreak has happened and you can trace, you know, how far away people were sitting in the seats and, and who got flu when. I don't think that the anything about the air handling makes it much difference. I mean, you, you don't need to worry whether the air is being uh, changed. When you breathe out, the most likely place for the air to go is to be breathed in by the person sitting next to you or in the room, up or down from you. So it is a, those kinds of environments. The tube train in London, where I travel almost every day, I think, I wonder who's breathing out flu at me now. <laughs> There's a, 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 an adage in occupational health that there are no dangerous substances, only dangerous concentrations. Yes. And the same is true for people, yes. which is why the, 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 the school holidays were, were a public health benefit, because it prevented the concentration of young people. So one, two, and then three. Uh, David Scott, is it known which uh, mutations in which gene or genes in the Spanish flu virus uh, caused this cytokine storm, and how, how did it trigger it? Yes, that's a really good question. So once people got the sequence of the Spanish flu, they tried to answer that question directly. And um, there are several genes of the Spanish flu virus which seem to contribute to the cytokine storm. So the virus itself is capable of very, very fast replication because its enzyme, the polymerase that copies the virus, is very, very fast. It also, though, has the spikes on the virus, the hemagglutinin spikes, seem to be very good at getting into cells and particularly can let the virus into some of those immune cells that seasonal flu doesn't always go in. So it's a combination. You can't put it down to a single mutation. And that's why I describe it a little bit like a perfect storm. This virus came out from, from birds, but, but the, the, the eight different gene segments of that virus, every single one of them appears to contribute in some way to the lethality of the virus. It, it isn't a simple, you can't assign a single one. It's all of them together that are working together. It's a sort of constellation that's doing it. 
and prevention uh, issues before a, a, before, uh, a universal vaccine come, comes along. One of the previous speakers here said that uh, the time of day in relation to your circadian rhythm was very important. He was a professor of circadian rhythms at Oxford. Uh, can you comment on that? Plus, the issue of the importance of and the frequency of hand cleansing during a, a, a pandemic. A pandemic. Yeah, so, so definitely the state of your cell, which is being uh, changed through the circadian rhythm, it alters how well the virus can replicate. And in fact, one of my colleagues working alongside me in the department of Imperial is, is studying flu and circadian rhythms and, and looking at that exact relation. And so the amount of virus, the numbers of viruses bursting out from any one infected cell will depend on what part of the circadian cycle that cell was in when it first got infected. And all of the cells of our body are going through the circadian rhythm the whole time, and, and so it does matter when you get infected. Whether right. or not... This was the vaccine. Okay. The circadian rhythm mm -hmm. in relation yep. to the vaccine. Yep. So there are studies too where people have been vaccinated in the morning or vaccinated in the afternoon, and again, you people have detected different antibody, the different strengths of antibody responses. At the end of the day, these are fairly small and subtle differences. So I think that the biology explains that the, the, the state of the cell matters. Your, your cells do change as they go through the circadian rhythm and any virus infection will depend on that because the virus is such a, a parasite, it depends utterly on what the cell is doing. And your immune response also depends on that as well. Um, but if you place that alongside other things that can affect the outcome of infection, so if I stand right next to you and you breathe a million viruses that I inhale, my immune system is totally overwhelmed. But if I stand here and somebody sneezes at the back of the room and one virus reaches me, my immune system is in a pretty good way of, of overcoming that and I'm going to win the battle rather than the virus. So the dose of virus you get and the route by which you get it and your, your other comorbidities are going to have a much bigger outcome on your infection than your circadian rhythm. Hello. Thanks very much for the, the talk. I was interested in asking you a couple of things, if I may. Uh, given the paratogenic potential of the new drugs that you're producing, and the fact that the mutation rate is very high, like against only 10% of phase 3 trials, wasn't it? Um, I was wondering if your ideas around the CRISPR, not so much the CRISPR itself, but host proteins that are needed for the flu vaccine, for the flu virus to survive, seem to me to be the best target because mutations there are not going to happen. Yes, so, um, so what you're... you're what we know is that and if we target the virus, the virus is a master at evolving very fast, and therefore you get resistant viruses when you treat people. And baloxavir, sadly, is, is really susceptible to this. So it's a fantastic new drug. It's being used in Japan, but you're quite right to say that 10% you know, or more of the children who've received baloxavir are now shedding <coughs> resistant virus. And once the virus has switched that way, it passes on to the next person, and in the next person, that drug is useless because the virus is already resistant. This is what happened in the early phase of HIV therapy, uh, where people were using antiretroviral drugs, and using single drugs uh, is hopeless because you just select one by one the resistant mutations. If you use combinations of drugs, the virus doesn't have anywhere to go because it can't mutate sufficiently to escape them all at once. And then if it only escapes one, the other one that's present can, can get it. So the, the way ahead if we're going to use directly acting antivirals is to use them in combination. There is a trial going on at the moment which is combining Tamiflu and Zofluza in the hope that at least for very sick people that's going to be the answer. But drugs targeting the host could be a better way. Maybe the virus can't escape that because the host has to stay the same maybe the virus will just decide to do things differently. So it could still get around. Viruses are slippery beasts. So we have to wait and see. There are several um, drugs in very early trials that target the host. 
For something like flu, I think it's conceivable because flu is such an acute illness that you're only asking a person to take a drug that targets their own body for a fairly short amount of time. For something like a chronic infection, you, you probably couldn't take that strategy. But I think it is feasible for flu, but there aren't any close to trials at the moment. There's a one over here. I think there was one. Just, and then there's two more, one here and one here. Then, then we'll have to close. <coughs> Thank you. Um, you know what you said about the pace at which the virus can mutate or evolve. I'm just wondering if there's a prospect that the, the virus will evolve in a way that will bypass the changes in the CRISPR yes. and, and, and modify it. And if that were the case, how frequently do you have to keep changing shipping? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's an excellent question. It's exactly what we're looking into at the moment, which is why I said that the, the experiments we're doing are being done in a very safe and closed environment, because what we don't want to do is to force the virus to change in a way which could make things worse, right? So, we, so we'll do it all very safely. We'll ask, does the virus mutate to escape these things? And if it does, it may be a question of going back to the, to the combination idea. So maybe we need to edit our chickens in two or three ways, because for the virus to get round two or three problems is much more difficult than for it to solve even three problems one at a time. So if you put three things in at once, it's, it's almost impossible for it to escape from that. So we could build up our CRISPR and, and have granny and grandpa chickens with three changes in all at once. That would be the solution. Uh, you talked about this genetic modification of um, chickens. I understand it's feasible you could perhaps do it in the European and the North American flocks, although you may get a certain amount of opposition in North America in certain groups. But what about the Asiatic sort of farmer who lives in Vietnam with his own little domestic chickens? Will you modify those? Yeah, no, that's a, an excellent point. Um, they, of course, there are different stocks of chickens. One can do CRISPR in, in such chickens. Um, and it is feasible to do, one would then have to ship them out. Bill Gates uh, is, is funding at the moment, uh, or trying to get going, a, an egg a day in Africa to improve um, protein intake in children in Africa. And by, in one of the things they're going to be looking at is whether to alter the chicken stock in backyard farms in Africa by restocking and I think that could actually be a timely opportunity in which one could improve the genetic stock in several ways that would also make them resistant to disease as well as giving them better yield for eggs and meat. But you would have to do it separately on every breed. Yes. Thank you. Finally. I'd like to ask you about seasonal uh, fluid virus. Because you, you know, you pointed out that that's a real killer and it's always changing and there's no error correction in the virus. So, is it possible and is it known from sort of work that you do what <coughs> sequence changes could occur in seasonal flu viruses that would make them very lethal in the population? Yes. So, Seasonal flu viruses come back year on year largely because they change the spikes on the outside and then all of the immunity that we've accumulated through natural infection or vaccination doesn't do us any good because the virus looks different than the antibodies. Usually that doesn't have a huge impact on the behaviour of the virus inside the cell and doesn't lead to things like cytokine storms. The viruses have already settled down, if you like, to be, to be pretty well adapted to the human host and remain seasonal. However, having said that, you know, there are random changes that occur and they can you know, alter the behaviour of the virus inside the cell in, in ways that, that can, I must admit, are still quite unpredictable. I mean, some years we see that a flu virus is causing more disease uh, even in the, the animal models which are well controlled and it's, it can be in a myriad of different ways. So it's pretty difficult at the moment to predict. But again, I think those, those changes are fairly small in the spectrum of, of the pandemic versus the seasonal in terms of cytokine storms or not. And, and going back to the sort of evolutionary theory, a virus which 
increases its virulence or pathogenicity usually doesn't do very well in the longer term. So we might have one year where we had a, a very bad year and a lot of people got sick like that. But that virus would not be the most efficient transmitter because people who are sick stay at home and don't go out and breathe their viruses for other people to breathe in. So eventually we go to a point where the viruses become less and less. It uh, remains for me to thank our speaker. Uh, there's a, in Oren Moore, which I'm sure many of you have been in, there's a quote high up on the wall from the, the late, great Alison Craig. And it says, let Glasgow flourish, and instead of by the preaching of the word, he's put by speaking the truth. <laughs> Typical Alistair Gray comment. And of course, some types of truth require evidence to be distilled and processed and refined, and that requires people with the ability to generate the evidence, not only to produce it, but to distill it and to share it in the way that we've seen and heard this evening. And I was trying to remember to myself what the applause reminded me of, and it was sitting in the concert hall listening to Nicola Benedetti, <laughs> an immediate search I mean, because the audiences appreciate star quality when they hear it. And we certainly have it tonight, so please give your thanks to Wendy Barker.